Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Today I want to teach you about the power of contentment. Wow. Just think how powerful it could be to just always be completely content. Now, even in saying that right off the bat, you might think, well, yeah, but I can't be content because I've got this I need and that I need and this isn't right and that isn't right and my kids aren't saved and my marriage isn't good. Well, you just hang on because I'm going to explain to you what it means to be content. To be content doesn't really mean that there's nothing else you want. It just means that you're totally satisfied where you're at right now on the way to where you're going. You know how to enjoy where you're at on the way to where you're going. You see, so often we have all these things that we want and we want to see happen. And, and you know, many of them are good things and many of them are even things that God's placed in our heart that truly are His will for us. But he still never wants us to be discontent while we're making the journey. How many of you have figured out that most things with God take longer than you thought they were going to? <laughs> And how about they're a little bit harder than you thought it might be? <laughs> well, I think the answer to making them easier, honestly, now please listen to me, I think the answer to making your journey easier is to make a decision, and you do have to make a decision in order to be content. You have to make a decision because the flesh is just flat out greedy. And if we go by the flesh, it's always just going to have one message, more, 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 now, 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 now. So the only way that we can really be content is to make a decision, however long my goal takes, whatever I have to go through, God is with me right now. He's in control. My main job in, in life is to worship Him, to praise Him, to fellowship with Him, and to trust Him to do what needs to be done in my life at the perfect time. You see, I don't have to be upset today because God hasn't done what I've wanted yet if I trust him that if today is the day that is right, then today it will happen. And if today is not the right day, then I just might as well enjoy this day while I'm waiting for God to do whatever he's going to do whenever he's going to do it. Now, to be honest, this was a little bit harder for me when I was a lot younger I think sometimes when you think you've got just a whole bunch of time left, you kind of think you've got a lot of time to waste. But let me tell you, when you get like on the other side, where you get to the point where you've lived more than you got left, <laughs> you start thinking a little differently. And then when you get to the point where you know that common sense tells you, well, about two-thirds, maybe a little more of this is gone, and so I've only got maybe about like one-third of this left, and that's even if I live to be pretty old. I'll tell you what, you, you get pretty determined, if you've got any brains at all, that you're going to enjoy every day of your life. And it's impossible now, now, just get this, it is not possible to thoroughly enjoy your life and be content if you're not going to totally trust God for the right timing in your life and the right provision. I want us to start by looking at Romans 11, 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. For all things originate with him, come from him, all things live through him, and all things center in and tend to consummate and to end in him, to him be the glory, amen. <laughs> So what's this really saying? It's all about Jesus. It's all about him. It's not about me. It's all about him. Let's think about it. Everything starts with him. Everything is sustained and maintained through him. 
Everything finds its ending in him. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the author and the finisher. He's everything in between. This journey that we have here is not about you and it's not about me, it's about Jesus. And the more we keep our eyes on what our real purpose is, the happier we get. We're here to glorify God, to live a life that's going to glorify him. And I don't, I've come to the point where I believe that it is insulting to God for any believer to be discontent. I'm just going to let you kind of nibble on that for a minute. I mean, if you're doing the very best that you can for your kids and you've got a really good plan for them, You've got provision for them. You've got things set aside for them. But you also see some little things in their character that you know needs to be worked out. They're just not maybe old enough in years yet for you to release all these things that you have planned to them. It's actually an act of love for a parent to say to the child, not yet. But they've still got a great life. <laughs> their needs are met. They have privileges. They have fun. They've got mom and dad to depend on. Now, how many of you know as a parent, if that kid is discontent all the time, it's just going to aggravate the tar out of you? <laughs> and if anything, if anything, it's going to cause you not to want to release the blessings to them that you have planned for them. But if, on the other hand, they're thankful, I trust you, Mom. I trust you, Dad. I know you love me. I know you got my best interest at heart. I know when the time is right, you'll see to it that I get that thing, wow, then that just makes you want to go, well, I think they're about ready. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get over being discontent. You say, well, I can't help the way I feel. Yeah, really, the truth is we can because our thoughts pretty much dictate our feelings. If you think right, you're going to start to feel better. And if we talk right, we're going to start to feel better. I'll show you scriptures today. I have one for the mind and one for the mouth where the Bible says point blank that the right kind of thoughts will satisfy you and the right kind of words will satisfy you. I spent too many years of my life being dissatisfied. And I mean, there was nothing that was going to quench that dissatisfaction in me because I was looking for the wrong things to fill my life. And as long as you're looking for the wrong thing to fill your life, then no matter what you have, you're never going to be satisfied. But when we know that only God can truly satisfy, then we can be satisfied all the time and we can enjoy what God gives us, but we're not going to be satisfied when we have it, dissatisfied when we don't. First Timothy chapter six, verse six. And it is indeed a source of immense profit for godliness accompanied with contentment, that contentment, which is a sense of inward sufficiency, is of great and abundant gain. So Paul was saying to Timothy, one of the best things you can have, buddy, my spiritual son, is godliness with contentment. Get up every day, want to do the most you can to be as much like Jesus as you can be for his glory. And while you're making your journey, be content. And so I'd like to say that to you today. As people that I have the privilege to teach the word of God, one of the greatest things that you can have in your life, one of the most powerful positions that you can have is to have the power of contentment. I just don't know what the devil can possibly do with us if no matter what he throws at us, we say, you know what? Maybe today I don't have everything I'd like to have, but I've got Christ, and I've got hope, and I've got faith, and I'm content. I know God's going to do other things in the future, but right now, today, devil, you are not going to steal this day from me. Today, I am content. <clears throat> I have a feeling there's a few of us here today that need this message. Content means to be, and I love this, satisfied to the point where you're not disturbed no matter what's going on. 
Content means satisfied to the point where you're not disturbed. You see, it doesn't mean that you never want anything else. I'm not asking you today to never want anything else. I think it's cool to just ask God for all kinds of things. I mean, Ephesians 3.20 tells us plainly that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we could ever dare to hope, ask, or think. Don't ask for small things in the presence of a king. I just heard a cute story. It may be true. I don't know for sure, but Arnold Palmer, the famous golfer, was in a foreign country playing golf, and it was a, a country that had a king. That was how their government was set up. And they were just so honored that he had come there to play golf. And so when it was about time for him to leave, the, the king said, we want to give you a gift to remember us by. And he said, oh, no, you don't have to give me a gift. I'm just honored to be here. No, I want to give you a gift. No, you don't have to give me a gift. And finally, the king said, well, actually, you're going to insult us if you don't let us give you a gift. And that is actually very much a cultural thing in a lot of the third world countries that I go to. It's very important to them. And uh, he said, well, okay. You know, he said, if, 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 if you really want to give me a golf club, that would be something that I could remember you by. So the next day, he was presented with the gift, and it was the deed to an 18-hole golf club, <laughs> including a clubhouse, including a restaurant, including a pro shop full of clothes. He asked for a golf club thinking about a driver or a three-wood or a nine-iron or whatever. Don't ever ask for small gifts in the presence of a king. <laughs> Amen. So please, please understand me. When I'm talking to you about being content, I'm not talking about not ever wanting anything. I'm not talking about not asking God for things. Ask and ask boldly. The Bible says you have not because you ask not in James 4, verse 2. I'd rather ask for a lot and get half of it than to ask for nothing and get all of it. So I'm big on asking God and being full of expectation about God doing great things in my life. But you can do all of that and still be totally content every day if you don't let these things that you want bother you. If it doesn't bother you, whether you get them or not. You see, I think that we have to really, even when we go to God and I say, well, you know, God, I'd like to have a bigger house. Or, you know, man, I've been, I've been single for all these years. I'd love to get married. Or, you know, I'd, I'd like to have a promotion at work. Or I'd like to do this. I'd like to be able to go on this great vacation. God, this is something that I'd really like to have. But I think really when we go into it, it's kind of cool to say to God too, you know what, this is something I'd like to have, but I just want to say up front, I can be happy without it. I want it. I believe that you can provide it. I'm extending my faith and asking for it, but you are my number one need. And as long as I have you, then I have everything that I need. Let's look at Philippians chapter four, verses 11 and 12. Contentment doesn't mean that you never want anything else. It means that you can be satisfied where you're at on the way to where you're going. How many of you would admit today that this is the right place for you to be today because if the truth be told, you have had a fair amount of discontentment in your life? How many of you get it when I say that I think that's an insult to God? Okay. And I'm certainly not just accusing anybody else. I lived like that for a good number of years. No matter what I had, it wasn't enough. I always wanted something else. You know, we are a people created by God and we're created for God solely for his purpose, to love him, to worship him, and to be the object of his love and his abundant grace. And so anytime that we let other things that we want get ahead of our relationship with God, it always just poisons us on the inside. And I'll tell you the, the truth, honestly and truly, for a lot of years, even as a Christian and even as a woman in ministry, I really didn't know what I'm trying to tell you here today. And I really just 
could not get happy. You know, I thought, well, if, if I could have, you know, the growth of my ministry was really important to me because that was my goal and dream. Whatever your goal and dream is, you want to see that progress. And so I thought, well, if I could just have 500 people in a meeting, then I'd be happy. Of course, then when I got 500, then it was like, well, if I could just have 1,000 people at a meeting, then I would be happy. Some of you have more money now than you ever thought that you would have in your life, and still there's a thing in our flesh that wants more. Some of you have more success, you have a great position, you, you thought, well, if I could just get married, I'd be happy, and so now you're married, and now you're thinking, well, if this person I'm married to would just behave a little better, then I could be happy. <laughs> Well, I could be happy if I had a bigger house, so now we got the big house. Well, I would be happy if I had somebody help me clean this big house. <laughs> so that then you get somebody, you don't like the housekeeper. Well, I would be happy if I could get along with this person who helps me clean the big house. Come on, is anybody home today? <laughs> Whatever it is that you think that you need today to make you happy, I can tell you that it really won't do it for very long. It might for a short period of time, but it won't do it long term. But if God is first in your life, I mean first, seek you first the kingdom and his righteousness, then other things will be added unto you and you can have them with joy. God is like, he, he's, he's jealous in the way that he doesn't want anything else to be before him because he knows that we were created solely for him and by him and that we don't function right when we put anything else ahead of him. So when God tells us to keep him first, it's for our benefit that he tells us that because that's the only thing that can truly make us happy. Now, the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4, verses 11 and 12, say some things that I'm sure you have read many, many times, but I want us to look at them again. Not that I'm implying that I was in any personal want, for I have learned how to be content, satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed or disquieted in whatever state I am in. I love that. I've learned how to be content no matter what state I'm in. This is going to be a great message, a great thought for you to kind of tuck in your little spiritual heart and hang on to for every day for the rest of your life. The moment you start to feel that discontent, say, God is working in my life, and I choose to be happy today. I choose to honor God by being content today and believing that he is going to always meet all of my needs. I'm, I know how to be abased and live in humble and straightened circumstances, and I know how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. I have learned in any and all circumstances the secret of facing every situation, whether going well-fed or going hungry, having sufficiency and enough to spare, or going without and being in want. I have strength for all things through Christ who empowers me. Now, I personally think that we may be bordering on being guilty of having abused Philippians 4.13. <laughs> because we tell people, oh, you can do anything. You've got the ability to do anything. But Paul was talking about something specific there. He said, look, you have the strength to stay happy if you're not getting what you want, and you have the strength to be happy if you are getting what you want. You, can, you have the power of God to be happy no matter what. And some of you are looking at me like you're not really sure that you believe me. How many of you believe that God can give you enough power to be happy no matter what? But it is a choice, isn't it? It's a choice that we have to make. And you know, I just finally decided that I was gonna be happy. Listen, I remember lots of years going home from these conferences after working so hard. And you know, my husband works hard too. He works hard in a different way. He sits and listens to me over and over and over <laughs> and over and over. And he actually appears to enjoy it, which has to be an anointing from God because every story I tell, he's already heard it a hundred times. And uh, he just, Dave believes that he's my covering and he's always there everywhere that I go. But when he gets home, he's tired in a different way. And so Dave likes to do 
his man thing. He likes to go to his man cave, and for him, that's the golf course or going out and hitting some golf balls. And, you know, many times that would leave me home alone, and I was tired and worn out, and then I would get all upset because he wasn't paying attention to me, not realizing that he'd sat there and paid attention to me for hours all weekend. <laughs> Come on, you see how we are? But even though he was giving me this, I wanted more. <laughs> I wanted more. I couldn't be content and satisfied with what he was giving me because I wanted him to give me more. And you know why? As long as we keep looking to somebody else to make us happy and we don't take responsibility for our own joy, we're always going to have a lacking in our life and always be sad. I must say that again, as long as you're giving somebody else the responsibility of making you happy, well, isn't, isn't it my spouse's job to make me happy? Well, it's your spouse's job to be good to you, and yes, we should do things for each other, but I'll tell you what, if you focus more on making other people happy, then you'll get happy in the process, and you'll be able to do it without even worrying about how it's going to happen. Some of you don't have some very happy marriages, and I'll tell you, if you go home and think about how you can make that other person happy, uh-oh. Well, I got a vocal group here today, I'll tell you. You know, sometimes we don't even think about stuff like that. It's like, well, oh, bless God, I'm not going to go and try to make him happy. He's my problem. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he's an unbeliever and you can't be happy with an unbeliever. Listen, I hate to tell you something, but, well, no, I don't hate to. I love to. If you, <laughs> if you are the believer or even the strongest believer in your family, you're not going to like this. You have the greater responsibility in the relationship. Come on, here comes another one. It's always the most spiritually mature person that does the right thing first. Oh, we're going deep now. But see, this is where we dig in both heels, and although we sing, I surrender all. <laughs> it's like, well, if you think I'm going to spend my time trying to make him happy, he don't do nothing for me, I'm not going to do anything for him. <laughs> Come on, you can turn anything around in your life if you'll begin to do things the way God wants you to. Now, discontent means not satisfied, unhappy, a feeling of resentment, unsatisfactory, a feeling of displeasure, an attitude of displaying pleasure. It always turns into grumbling, murmuring, complaining, jealousy, envy, and a depressed, sad countenance. Now, you know, in Proverbs 31, the perfect woman is described. And I just have to be honest and tell you, this lady used to just really get on my nerves. I mean, I am not kidding. When I first started trying to have a serious walk with God and I really got an understanding on what a pitiful wife I was, then I mean, I really wasn't a very good one. And I'm reading about her, I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> she does everything and he just sits by the gate and takes all the praise. <laughs> If you're not familiar with it, you got to read it. <laughs> well, I mean, isn't that pretty much what it says? Anybody who knows it, I mean, she's getting up early and getting the food and doing this and doing that and praying and even says she's fit. She works out. She lifts weights. She does, does everything for this guy. And he sits in the city gate and is famous because of his fine wife. Amen. Well, I, I read this to Dave occasionally. It is well known in the city gates because of your fine wife. So there you go. <laughs> but I love verse 27. She looks well to how things go in her household. And the bread of idleness, gossip, discontent, and self-pity she will not eat. I love that. In other words, here's a woman who has made up her mind, I am not going to allow those life-stealing negative emotions in my life. I'm not going to sit around and waste one more day feeling sorry for myself because somebody else is not doing what I would like them to do to make me happy. 
My joy is in God. It's not in whether or not Dave stays home or doesn't stay home or this or that or something else. Our joy has to be in God. Let me tell you something. It is so important that you spend regular time with God and that we really get it through our head that we need to seek God's face and not just his hand. And there's no problem with asking God for things, but I found out if I seek his face, his hand is always open. In other words, if I go to God wanting him first, he gives me the things that I want. How many of you are blessed, 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 blessed? All right. There's no reason for any of us not to be content. Now remember, contentment doesn't mean that you don't ever want anything or that you don't want to see any change in your life, but it means that you can be satisfied where you're at on the way to where you're going through trusting God and believing that He's working in your life. Here at the ministry, we strive to help people both here in the U.S. and around the world. We do that by providing help such as the gospel, medical care, clean water, feeding programs. It's like being part of one big family, and today I'm inviting you to join the family. If you're not a partner with Joyce Meyer Ministries, we would so appreciate your commitment to become one. We don't ask for or require any certain amount of money. All that we ask you to do is pray and then do what you believe that God has asked you to do and to do it consistently. It's the consistency that is really important to us because we're consistently on television daily around the world and so we need consistent partners that are going to stick with us. And not only will you be helping preach the gospel through television, but all these many, many thousands upon thousands of outreaches, people being fed and clean water being provided and medical care and putting books into prisons and all the things that Jesus tells us not to forget to do. And so I believe that you will pray and that if God puts it on your heart to join the family, I believe that you will. So thank you for your consideration. God bless you. Werk, huishouden, vrije tijd en nog veel meer. Het moederschap is een fulltime uitdaging. Groeit alles je soms boven het hoofd? Krijg weer rust, zelfvertrouwen en vreugde die dieper gaat. Laat je inspireren door Joyce Meyer, zelf moeder van vier kinderen. Je hebt het verdiend. Het boek van Joyce Meyer, de zelfverzekerde moeder. Bestel je eigen exemplaar nu via joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch via 026 2022 100. That's why no person here tonight or watching by TV, you do not have to have fear in your life that it's too late for you, that you've done too much wrong, that there's no hope for you. You do not have to live in fear because God is the Redeemer. He has bought us back with the blood of Christ and everything in our life can be bought back, worked over and turned into something good. Meer leerzame impulsen vind je op het Joyce Meyer YouTube kanaal. Zoek het maar eens op.